a very good morning a very good afternoon a very good evening depending on what part of the world you are in uh, welcome to the session 14 of the world universities summit 2023 uh, the title of the morning session today here in india is being local university as a site of local innovation and meaningful community engagement i have with me today joining me as a part of this panel Mr. John Moloney, Pro Vice Chancellor and Vice President, International Deakin University, Australia. Professor Dr. Nee Newman Pushpan in Singh, Vice Director, Research, Innovation and Community Development, Erlanga University, Indonesia. And my dear colleague uh, from Jinder Global Law School, Professor Alexander Milanov. Uh, the title, uh, which is Being Global, uh, is, is something which is a mix of global as well as local. And it touches on a very pertinent aspect that is basically, you know, evolving every single day, which is innovation and that too at a local level. Now, a university's commitment is not just to its own academic community, but also towards the local community, region, nation and the entire world, which should serve as the motivation of its institutional planning initiatives, decisions, and actions for the greater good of humanity and our planet. The ambition and scope of reputed universities in the world are global, but they think and act locally before they do so globally. Meaningful engagement with the community in which they operate is a hallmark of their mission and culture. With constant engagement through a variety of ways, including research and scholarship, social outreach and services, consultations and advocacy, experiential learning and training opportunities to boost local innovation with the university as the site of external investment, they strengthen the development of their communities. However, the success of universities in contributing to community engagement hinges largely on their ability to connect with society through its faculty, staff, students, and alumni. Interaction with the communities should be woven into the fabric of everything they do. Specifically, they should have to sustain their connections with both rural and urban communities that help cultivate long-term collaborative and reciprocal partnerships. But how will they define community university engagement, identify and respond to community issues, produce positive outcomes, and create a lasting change. This panel today will explore ideas about how we can ensure an inclusive and dynamic university governance that inspires broad-based community engagement programs, partnerships, and initiatives with local as well as regional communities and neighborhoods in ways that have an impact on society and stimulate local innovation. Without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to also welcome the fourth speaker uh, for this panel today, Professor Paul Dangerfield from Capilano University, Canada. Uh, Professor Paul, a very good uh, evening to you, I would suppose, right? It's, it's morning here in India. Uh, it's evening in um, late evening in Canada. So um, I would like to first invite uh, Mr. John Moloney to to uh, put forth his his initial thoughts on the title of the talk today. Thank you very much, Manveen and um, colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here today, and particularly so for me representing Deakin University. OP Jindal Global University um, is a dear partner of ours, a strategic partner of ours, in fact, in India. For Deakin University, we've had an office um, for 29 years and a, a local representation in India. Um, so we're deeply embedded, deeply connected with India. And recently, um, in recent years, we've really put a sharp focus on which priority partnerships that we want to focus our attention and resources and um, OP Jindal Global University, an outstanding uh, private university by any measure is a really important partner for us. So great to be here. So Deakin University, I'm, I'm talking from Melbourne today, but actually the university is headquartered in the second city. We have a re regional 
um, uh, chancery at uh, Geelong, which is the second city of Victoria. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we're a young and a dynamic university, 49 years of age. Um, we've got a, a great trajectory as a, a university that's progressive and moving forward across the mission, the teaching and learning mission, um, the research mission, and also the uh, third pillar, the community engagement is um, very important to us. So we're about 65,000 students. We're a large university and we operate for a number of physical campuses. So our largest campus by student population is based in this great education hub, higher education hub of Melbourne. And so we're a very much a part of the community here in Melbourne. But as I say, we're at the Chancellery and we're um, established formally in the second city of Geelong. And we have two campuses there, a, a waterfront campus located on Corio Bay, a beautiful location. And we have uh, in suburban Geelong, we have the Warren Ponds um, campus. And then about three and a half hours um, from Melbourne on the southern coast, west on the southern coast in the west um, central of Victoria, we have a smaller um, um, uh, rural campus at Warrnambool. So the theme that we're addressing today, global and how we engage communities in a meaningful way. And of course, with my portfolio um, in international, um, this is something we've thought deeply about at Deakin, including in our latest um, strategic planning, which was released just a couple of years ago, Ideas to Impact 2030. So we said some really fundamental things in that document about delivering impact both locally and globally and connecting the two um, and empowering ourselves to serve our communities both here in Australia um, and abroad. And India is very much a part of um, where we locate community. So we talk about being internationally connected. And um, in our case, we have a special, you know, we recognize that, that we have limited resources. So we want to focus um, where we're going to be active. We've identified, um, identified one region, the Indo-Pacific, and five key countries in that region, foremost um, being India, where we want to put particular effort and um, concentration of focus. So we talk about international connection and uh, we talk about very much when we're talking about our international plan. So there is no single section in our um, Ideas to Impact 2030 about internationalization. It's embedded in all that we do and it spans um, the mission um, as we work across. But we do make particular note as to, you know, why we're motivated to be internationally connected as any um, world-class university is, but really to bring the community along and to connect community as we're going. So I'll, I'll read one, just one comment for one quote from the, um, from the strategy document. So Deakin's social contract with Australia extends to our ability to teach, to learn from, and to collaborate with the best minds in the world. So we're really about building those, um, those bridges, and I think we, we do, it, do it well. So I'll just spend a few moments now putting some of that to, um, to life, to making it real through our experience at our Warren Ponds campus in Geelong. So Geelong, as I said, is the second city in Victoria. It's a population of about 300,000, but in recent years, it's the fastest growing city in Australia. So it's a very dynamic city. It's also a city that's under, undertaken a long period now of um, 15 years of economic transformation. The Ford Motor Company was located, headquartered, it's Australian headquarters and manufacturing was based in Geelong. Um, but about a decade ago, uh, uh, production of vehicles uh, ceased in Australia. So that was a big challenge for, um, uh, for the Geelong economy. But it's also left a lot of um, residual, it left a lot of residual um, advanced manufacturing. And Geelong has played, uh, De Deakin has played an important role in harnessing that power and connecting it to what is a, uh, the Warren Ponds campus is very much a STEM-based campus. Our medical schools there, our engineering schools, and many of our leading institutes in areas such as material science, artificial intelligence, 
sustainable and green, um, green energy and environmental sustainability. So there is a lot going on and we build spaces. So we have research that we want to connect with communities and, and industry, and we build spaces for that to occur. For, so for example, we have an advanced manufacturing hub where we um, selectively invite companies to establish at that hub. Um, some of the criteria is that they need to be in a startup mode or early stages of development. And they need to have um, to be working in an area where they can connect and support our research agenda. So that's um, the, the Manu Futures, Deakin Manu Futures Hub has been um, a, a great success and it's been very warmly uh, met by that local, um, uh, local industry, but not only local industry. So for example, one of the areas that um, of particular strength is energy, um, uh, energy capture through a battery technology, advanced battery technology. And one of the clients subsequently at um, Manu Futures is a uh, battery startup, advanced battery startup from Singapore. There are other examples. So uh, I, I mentioned that we're, we're world-class in material science. We have one of just uh, a couple of um, carbon fiber mills that is located in a research environment at a university globally, the only one in the Southern hemisphere. And that works with industry. So we have an industry partnership that um, uh, carbon revolution that manufactures um, uh, carbon fiber components, including uh, having a contract with Ferrari to make um, vehicles for their top end um, sports cars. So there's a lot of um, connectivity there. Um, we, we've got a particular ambition to play our role in um, the transition to green energy. And we're focusing on the, um, the, the uh, fuel stations of the future. So what are fuel stations going to look like when we're reliant on green energy? We have a large um, solar array on that campus and we're ambitious to go carbon neutral by um, 2025. Um, we, we actually bought that timeline um, forward and we're making good progress on that. So it's a living laboratory in terms of green energy. We're also doing um, not only in, in carbon, but in hydrogen, um, and we have some um, projects working in hydrogen as well. Um, and I'll, finally, I'll just say, given that um, I'm talking to a, an, a, a global audience, I'm aware of that, but also the particular focus um, into India. So we, we're, Deakin is um, working with our, a longstanding partner, IIT Madras, in um, looking at some of these um, green and sustainable energy solutions. And we're putting forward projects uh, currently um, into the uh, what's been agreed last year, the Australia India Energy um, Initiative. So I hope that gives a, a, an example by looking at our STEM-based uh, campus at Warm Ponds of how we're um, taking the international and connecting it to the local in a powerful way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like you to kind of uh, reflect a little bit on how the innovation ecosystem uh, has been uh, functioning in, in Canada uh, over the last uh, few years, just to kind of give a, of a background to um, take the stock forward. Thank you, um, I'm there. Um, uh, so uh, Capilano University, we are uh, not the size of uh, Deakin. We have about 10,000 students, although we are uh, considered a regional university um, and with five campuses spread across uh, what we say is the North Shore of Vancouver. Uh, some of you will know the connection uh, all the way up to Whistler, uh, which is one of where the, the Olympics were in 2010 the Winter Olympics and up the Sunshine Coast. We we have in our region that, um, and I, I say this word specifically um, as it connects to innovation, we have a region in which we serve uh, eight different municipalities, eight different chambers of commerce, five school districts, five First Nations uh, uh, communities, um, and, uh, and 
the the way in which we're seeing this innovation um, locally and then uh, moving out internationally is it not dissimilar to uh, to John's comments that we we embarked a number of years ago on a 2030 plan we call it envisioning 2030 but what we specifically uh, did um, Anvin, is we we went out to those communities that I mentioned and said what do they need from the university what can we do as a university to actually serve you and um, as we went uh, through that process we heard the the spectrum of uh, of uh, asks uh, of any university that you would see but innovation uh, was one of the key elements of what they were looking for uh, however, there were there were other um, uh, and those inno innovations were not just restricted to uh, to climate action. Uh, they were not just restricted to uh, engineering. Uh, they were also asking and reaching out to us, uh, looking for innovations and support around really um, issues related to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. They were looking for uh, innovation uh, around how municipalities can um, uh, can actually have uh, good governance and uh, and over oversight of their organizations, um, and looking for ways in which we could support that. So part of what we did was we did develop a a ten year plan envisioning twenty thirty. And in that, we, we came up with uh, a vision for the university, which is a university inspired by imagination. And I want to talk about that just for 30 seconds here. Uh, our faculty and our students said, well, you can't have innovation or creativity if you don't have imagination. And so we, we, we have anchored everything that we do around imagination. And then we looked at, OK, what can we do to differentiate the university and we we landed on a, a purpose, a social purpose, of uh, that uh, for the university, which is to um, which is to uh, cultivate life enhancing experiences for our employees, uh, our students, our alumni, and specifically the communities that, that we serve. Those ones that I mentioned. When we did that, we then um, uh, bridged that with a new international strategy that saw how can we reach out around the world. Uh, to uh, like-minded um, uh, communities uh, that believed in and had those same values as ours, not simply just the same academic values, not just same research values or uh, research uh, agendas, but those that had the same values. So what we're seeing, for example, is um, a variety of, uh, of innovations around everything from, uh, as, as you will probably know in, 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 in uh, in, in British Columbia on the west coast of Canada, we are considered Hollywood North. Um, we have a we have a, a significant film and animation program, and the related supporting programs that go into that. So the the uh, bringing everything to that industry around the technology for digital animation, the technology for film, but I would put on top of that, bringing in the, what we are learning from our First Nations people what we're learning from our immigrants and from our new Canadians around justice, equity, and diversity, and putting that all together to say that you cannot have innovation if you're not actually also thinking about the impact it's having on its communities, both locally and uh, internationally. So what I would say is in the secret sauce in all of this for us um, has been around looking for um, international partners uh, to that have the same shared values that we have uh, around community. So I, I think I could probably pause there and say, simply say it's the two, it's the actual innovation in the technology, but it is also innovation in terms of what we're doing with our uh, socially with our communities. Right, right. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for that uh, insightful uh, background to to all the uh, initiatives that have been taken up uh, by Capilano University uh, there in Canada. Uh, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Nee to throw some light on how the innovation initiatives um, have been carried out in Indonesia. 
uh, and uh, more specifically, Erlanga University. Uh, Prasanni, over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, it is our pleasure to join this uh, program. So uh, Indonesia, uh, in the Ministry of Edu Higher Education, Culture, Research and Technology, uh, we have three pillars, compulsory done by the higher education institution. The three pillars of higher education is the, the one is education, and then number two, research, and number three is community development. So it's mean that all Indonesian university will do for all the three pillars in higher education and also involving is not only for the teacher or researcher or lecturer or the professor or any other the civitas academica, but also involve the student. So the student also will do uh, for the three pillars they, they will learn about uh, the teaching and learning uh, process in the university, but they are also doing for their research as the part of the final of their study and also for the community development. So we call it now, like uh, also Professor John already uh, discussed with me related to the Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka. So we call it independence uh, learning for the student. So students can study with the society, community, the stakeholder, industry, local government, and also university beyond their home institution, national and international. So how about Universitas Erlangga? So our university have the strategic uh, planning uh, 2021 until 2025. We call it SMRRNT, so the smart university. So it's mean of the, the, the S is meaning of the sustainable education for all. So for lifelong learning, uh, anyone uh, can also uh, uh, reach Universitas Erlangga to like more formal or informal uh, learning. And also the second one uh, is the M. M, uh, this is uh, my responsibility for the meaningful research and community development, this is M. And the A is advancing the linkage with the stakeholder or maybe industry and also enterprising because our university is autonomous university. Uh, so we are also uh, would like to becoming the entrepreneurial university uh, in the future. So we also uh, made a research and community engagement with the stakeholder and also industry. So the R is responsive uh, and lean management, and also the T is uh, topping up the tangible and intangible resources utilization. So for this uh, meeting or conference today, we are also by responsibility in research and community development. So the, the M is very important. So for community development, we would like to strengthening and also uh, uh, encouraging uh, the people. So strengthening in the meaning uh, of research and community uh, development and services to support the achievement of the SDGs. So how we can do that? So we have a grand design to do uh, the research and community development to give the impact. So what also uh, already mentioned by Professor John and Professor uh, uh, Paul, that the, the grand design of research, innovation, and community development in Universitas Erlangga, uh, from the input, we have been not only uh, achieving the output or reaching only the, the output, but we would like to more forward to the outcome, the outcome and also uh, the impact for society and community. So how we can then uh, designing this? By using the Hexahelix collaboration scheme. So we already have best practices uh, of implemented the hexahelix uh, collaboration scheme. What this mean of the hexahelix? Uh, I think all the distinguished guests are already know that the hexahelix is not only triple helix of academia, industry, and government, but we also have another three sector, the community, and then the uh, mass media, and can be like NGO or law. So the best practices of this, we successfully do for producing 
a COVID-19 vaccine for our community uh, in national uh, demand. So we have produced and already got the emergency use authorization uh, for uh, COVID-19 vaccine uh, that uh, called by our president in Nampa. I think uh, we can also sh uh, see in the, from the internet website that Inaf Inafak is already now uh, produced in Indonesia. So we use this hexahelix collaboration scheme. So it's been the community, what the mean of community? The community also students who do the research, the hospital, a medical doctor, uh, also the society, the community for the people who becoming uh, our clinical uh, trial. And then uh, until now, we still finishing, finalized for the permanent use authorization uh, to do for this kind of the 4,005, uh, totally with the clinical trial, uh, the third phase, the second and the first phase, totally around uh, 400 and uh, 4,500. And we are also due for the booster, a uh, heterologue booster for this vaccine. So this means that this hexahelix scheme of the collaboration is successfully, uh, we uh, done it uh, for the Inafac vaccine. Uh, this is also, we uh, invited and discussed with the African uh, ambassador in uh, Indonesia and also Indonesian ambassador in Africa and university uh, there, we discussing how and at the time before the G20 uh, hosted by uh, Indonesia in Bali, we also sharing about our uh, vaccine at that time is still in clinical trial. So how our vaccine also can giving the meaningful in African uh, people. So uh, another side for the community engagement in local area, we have also Erlanga uh, Community Development Hub. So like also mentioned by Professor uh, Moloni from Deakin University that this hub, uh, we uh, choose three area in Indonesia because Indonesia is archipelago country. So we would like to give a good impact, positive impact to our community in Indonesia. So we choose three parts of the Indonesia in coastal area, uh, remote island, because we have 17,000 island in Indonesia. So we are focusing on remote island in Indonesia. And then this, uh, the last one uh, in our uh, hub, is border island because Indonesia also very near with Australia. We are very near with the ASEAN country, Malaysia, and also Singapore. So we do now in our pilot project with the Bintan Island. Bintan Island is border island, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So what we do for this time, we have five priority uh, strategic program, the green economy, blue economy, circular economy, health, and uh, tourism and conservation. So why we put tourism together with the conservation? Because it means that uh, we have big mega uh, diversities of natural resources. So we, ha we have to maintain for the sustainable uh, development uh, goals, uh, actually for the fillets. So we call it SDGs uh, fillets. So this is the community engagement that we do. And for supporting the global community engagement in Universitas Erlangga also initiated as the founder of WUACD. This one is World University Association for Community Development. So this established in 2018. And until now we have 13 universities member international universities members, and one of them also Jindal Global University as our new member for WUACD. We have also a university member from Australia, from Asian country, from Europe. So we do together for the impact uh, of our university academia to the community, not only in a local or national in Indonesia, but also in global. So now we do for the Turkish uh, society or community that uh, impact uh, by the earthquake. 
So now we are designing a proposal because we, we communicate with the Turkey University member in WUACD. Uh, they need food uh, for, the, uh, for the earthquake uh, uh, people, impact for the earthquake. Uh, one of the food, uh, like food menu, uh, the simple one for the uh, people there, and also the second one, sanitation. So we will uh, designing the proposal of two priority. So for mental health or trauma healing, something like that is very difficult because they don't use uh, English as their language. So that's very sensitive for the mental health and uh, as a psychological uh, approach. So we don't do that. So only food and sanitation. And also we are uh, 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 donating, uh, um, we uh, make a flyer for a donation uh, for the people who impacted of this uh, earthquake. So that is uh, we do in our universitas Erlangga for giving the meaningful of research and community uh, engagement and development or also services uh, by universitas Erlangga. We also have supporting facility like we have teaching hospital, we have infection, special infection disease hospital, we have also uh, dental uh, hospital and also animal uh, hospital. For this, I think this is uh, very important because Universitas Erlangga is comprehensive university. We belong to the health, life, uh, and then engineering, social, and uh, huma, humanity uh, sciences. I think this is uh, what Universitas Erlangga do for the local, national, or also international engagement on uh, community. Uh, development uh, program. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nee. Uh, and I'd like to uh, move on to uh, Professor Alexander. And uh, uh, Alex, I would uh, kind of like you to reflect a little bit on your experience here uh, for the last few years that, that you've been at Jindal. Uh, in terms of how you see uh, community engagement and local innovation taking place not just at uh, Jindal Global University but in general in India because I'm sure you would have traveled around uh, the country and you yes. would have noticed you know quite a few things so your thoughts on the same. Oh wonderful thank you very much Manvin and thank you uh, dear colleagues for your uh, presentation so far. I, uh, I will start answering your question. Uh, so first of all of course India is a is a major, I would say, player in international relations and a state that uh, has a lot to give to the world. And when I joined here, I didn't know exactly what to expect because uh, my initial uh, connection here, I, I didn't know anybody from Jindal. So uh, we had a, a meeting in Bulgaria. So it was uh, just exchange of words uh, between uh, Professor Sani and Jitu Mishra and myself. So when I came here, I started, I saw how uh, we are building something uh, uh, that a university, an institution that uh, can stand as a, as a pillar of, I would say, excellence for the whole of India. Uh, not just education-wise, but also in the way that uh, we were engaging with communities and, and also uh, communities and the state. Uh, I'll give just one example. So we have a, in India, one of the major issues that uh, we're seeing here is the uh, air pollution. And this is something that uh, it is, uh, it has been seen as a uh, unintended consequence because of the development of the, of the nation. But at the same time, there are a lot of solutions that can be used and implemented. Of course, it has to be done by the government with the, um, support and understanding of local communities. And here in Jindal, what I saw are perfect examples of what we're discussing today of uh, global, global and local, which means basically uh, using these archetypes of uh, glo global and local perspectives to integrate them in one and create an instrument and a practice that serves, for example, the agricultural uh, industry here in uh, Sonipat and uh, later on, why not in as a good practice in New Delhi? So uh, I had uh, discussions uh, on this topic, for example, with Professor Sudarshan, 
uh, on the uh, who is the dean of the governmental policy in our university. And uh, we were discussing and understood that uh, land was provided uh, specifically for from our university uh, in the area surrounding the campus just to test uh, the different agricultural practices and to show the communities here how they work. Uh, this is vital so that, for, first of all, they understand how to utilize different uh, innovation in agricultural products. And secondly, hopefully, to understand uh, how to process and not to burn, basically, the residuals of their soil. So in order to resolve problems, big global problems like this air pollution, which is causing uh, tremendous damages, not uh, only uh, about the economy, but also the health of the people, uh, I am aware and I know and I, I will advocate for finding those solutions that are uh, practical, meaningful, and then can be communicated with uh, the stakeholders that can implement them. It could be uh, a simple machine that is preparing the soil in a faster way and instead uh, which is going to substitute the need for burning the residuals that cannot be used after that. So things like this are uh, the examples. Well, this, this is just one example that uh, uh, I'm giving here um, that I've seen in our university. Uh, if I have enough time, maybe I, I would share one of the, um, the main basically expose you know, right now. Or, because I'm not sure that uh, it will have time to address it in a question uh, after that. So um, many of you today uh, discussed uh, the importance of uh, the universities uh, in general as institutions that are not just serving their stakeholders, students, academia, but also as, as you have mentioned, uh, Professor Marvin, also uh, serving um, humankind and whole planet. So one of the projects that I hope we are going to um, initiate soon because it is in a very early stages of development. So we have, a, we have to discuss it and refine it um, in the future. Is uh, the importance is based on what Professor Ni said, the importance of conservation. So as, as we know, climate change is a, is a topic that uh, is a major issue that is present in all of our classrooms. Uh, and whatever we're teaching, we're connecting our students and we are informing them about this topic. But at the same time, our all universities could serve as a good institutional example, organizational example, uh, a community that provides a good practice for other, not only universities, but for other companies and even states. And the project that I'm talking uh, today uh, refers to uh, doesn't have a name so far, but it refers to uh, support and conservation of uh, endangered uh, plant and animal species. Now, uh, if you go to this data, you'll see that uh, WWF right now um, provides information that uh, there are around, around 10,000, close to 10,000 endangered species. This is the estimate of, of this year. And at the same time, we have around 24,000 universities Let's say half of them are uh, leading in their leaders in their fields and uh, functioning properly as universities. So the idea is uh, to engage with our university, not with the universities, with our university and our community in the university, but uh, university international collaborations to use these international collaborations to engage. Uh, in an act of so-called symbolic adoption of one endangered species by university. Now, it, it is not just a symbol, and it, it doesn't mean that the university will take all the responsibility for protecting this particular species, uh, but uh, it will be, uh, um, it will provide, I'm sure, a lot of depth, understanding, opportunities, not, not just for um, the uh, professional ecologists who are working in this specific area, but it also engage different level of resources, uh, including the possibility for uh, financial support, for um, 
helping uh, students, our students and our uh, colleagues to understand more about the, this specific issue. So we can engage with something uh, meaningful uh, when we, in, in my view, when we are specific enough and we are aiming to find the exact, um, how to say, the, the exact button that we need to press in order to move our machine, to move our civilization forward, to overcome the amazing, um, to overcome, they're not amazing, they don't, to overcome the great challenges that we are facing right now. So this initiative, I hope we're going to present soon. And uh, let's see how many partners we're going to engage with. But even if there are 100 or 500 universities uh, doing that, uh, it will be, uh, I think, a, a real show of force and a um, good example for different organizations, not just universities. So this is what I would like to share today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Uh, it, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, you know, it raises a lot of questions as to uh, how much we've done and what more could we do in terms of increasing the uh, community uh, engagement or or the university community engagement, uh, as well as probably uh, address some of the challenges uh, that that have been coming the way of the universities in terms of their ability to meaningfully engage with the community. On, on, on those lines and in terms of what um, we've just heard uh, from our speakers uh, over the last 20-25 uh, minutes, I would like to ask uh, firstly Professor Paul. Uh, Professor Paul, we know that universities uh, a lot of times have the necessary intellectual capital uh, to innovate for creating an impact <coughs> for their local communities. Uh, but what, in your opinion, uh, are some of the challenges faced uh, in creating meaning meaningful community engagement? Or probably some of the challenges that you have yourself observed uh, or you have to deal with in terms of uh, your ability to engage with the, uh, with the local communities? <clears throat> Certainly, and I, I imagine uh, a few of the ones that I will mention are, are common for all of us. Um, I think uh, th typically there, there are, in my view, um, and as we look at it in our communities, both locally and internationally, um, these initiatives require uh, a commitment of resources, uh, both in terms of fin finance, financial resources and time. Um, and uh, they also require uh, that expertise that you mentioned um, to be able to be um, participating and being engaged for what I would say is, is the long journey for it takes time for us to make these changes. And as we are trying to do that, uh, the, the impact of um, uh, different um, economic impacts, the different societal impacts. We find that both um, the availability of time and money is is always uh, we're always wondering whether we're going to have it next year uh, and the next year and the next year. So we're always doing this on a cyclical basis. Um, and then uh, and then we may find, for example, if it is a faculty member who has a research in our case, we, we work uh, with the House Sound Biosphere, which is uh, a UNESCO site. We have half a dozen very dedicated faculty and community leaders. But as they then move on to other initiatives and other priorities, it is hard to maintain that. So um, perhaps what I would say is, um, you know, I think we're all experiencing that. What is really absolutely critical um, as we're looking at how you can overcome those things is it really critical? I think all of us have spoken to the need for a strategic plan for thinking about this in the long game and making sure that we have long-term goals for what we want to do. I think that's absolutely critical to be able to to over to to be able to overcome that um, as we're we're looking at the these kinds of challenges. And what I would say is that um, it also requires, um, I know we consistently say and have been saying our students, our faculty, our researchers, 
Uh, frankly, if the administration and the organizations aren't committed to it as well, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, so you actually have to have that strategy, that commitment from the chancellor to the vice chancellor, right down to the faculty to be able to do it. Um, and you actually have to ultimately get it into the culture uh, of your communities that you want to, that we are going to, in our case, I've used the House Island Biosphere and the UNESCO site, that we have committed as a community locally and internationally that we'll actually overcome it because there are many, many things that will knock us around as we're trying to execute on that. So. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Paul. Uh, that's that's actually um, uh, quite true uh, in terms of um, you know the 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 challenges that uh, are facing us or have been facing us, and uh, a, a concerted sort of an effort required right from the top to the very uh, lowest possible level, so that everybody is uh, working towards a common goal, and that's pretty much the key in achieving what we all want to in terms of a meaningful community engagement. Uh, I would not now like to uh, kind of go to uh, Mr. John. Uh, and very interesting that you mentioned about the Ford uh, example, and of course the auto industry at large uh, in the Victorian uh, region. Uh, my my question to you is: What do you think uh, is the role that governments and universities together can play? in orienting and encouraging more institutions to innovate and engage with the community. Is community engagement essentially a rural phenomena or can it be extended to urban spaces as well? Um, and, and what are the larger possibilities of collaboration that can make such initiatives by universities more impactful? Uh, there are always gonna be you know, situations where probably uh, like, the, like the Ford situation you mentioned where suddenly something comes up and you probably have not foreseen some such a thing or anticipated such a thing and suddenly you have to now think okay how can the government uh, intervene here if at all it can and is there some sort of a collaboration between the universities on one hand and the government on the other that can help kind of reset the entire situation and allow everybody to move forward so mr john over to you Thanks for that question, Manveen. And I think a little bit like uh, Paul at the outset of um, his uh, answer to the last question, it would be common for many of us. But it's a very dynamic um, situation that, of course, as a large um, public institution with great capacity, um, we pay a lot of attention to the um, nexus between federal government and the national agenda, as well as state government and um, the, the more regional and local um, agenda. Um, so we have, uh, we work very hard on maintaining those channels and um, through like the university directly, but also through um, our, our group. So we're in the Australian, um, uh, the ATN, the Australian Technology Network, a group of um, six universities, which have a similar sort of orientation to Deakin, they're younger, they're technically oriented um, progressive universities. So we, we lobby government, but we're um, forever responding to, uh, it's a very dynamic relationship. So we're responding, uh, creating submissions into government policy. So it's both that formal, uh, but the informal uh, lines are really important as well. I think one of the things, though, that's really important is connecting it back to community. So it can't simply be a um, institution to government dialogue. You have to make it real for your local community. And I think um, a large part of that, and we, we've thought a lot about this at Deakin as well, and I mean, it's less a challenge for us than some of our older universities with, you know, a century and a half history and... Uh, some embedded um, uh, reputation and perhaps uh, less progressive, uh, if I might say. So um, we, we want to make sure that we're um, bring, bringing the, that we're responsive and we remain open to the community. And that's not just a, um, a, a factor of, you know, making sure we're not a cloistered institution, but really working hard at creating those fora, creating the connection points for the conversations um, to take place. 
because it's only at that stage where you'll understand what is most important to the community and what you should be advocating for when you're going to government um, at the state and federal level. So we, we do put a lot of effort into keeping the doors of the university open. That can be challenging. So I described the situation in Geelong where it has it is um, you know, still an economy. It's a healthy economy, but it's one that um, continues to uh, undertake this transformation. And sometimes, we, and, and a lot of it actually is um, small and medium enterprises, even though it's advanced manufacturing, a lot of it is that um, small and, and often entrepreneurial family owned businesses. Sometimes it's too easy for the university to seem um, locked away from uh, or too hard to engage with. Uh, so we do put a lot of effort into making sure that um, the dialogue uh, it, it remains open. And finally, I would also say that um, when you're talking to um, government and you look here in Australia, we have, I think, uh, a really good framework um, supporting the uh, research agenda. But it's also, and we've been very successful at Deakin at winning some very major uh, projects, thematic projects in the research field in, in recent years. But you have to be really careful about um, thinking about what you want to focus your efforts on and recognising that you can't do it all. So I mentioned earlier about the Warren Ponds and the Green and Sustainable Energy Project. We've got parameters, pretty um, hard parameters around that. We know where we want to play in that space. Um, and in, in other areas throughout the university, uh, we have a, a similar discipline. So from my perspective, when our um, medical faculty was uh, drafting their five-year strategy international, uh, their five-year strategy last year, I was talking to them, but, you know, and we had um, a lot of activity and we still do, but it was very clear and deliberate that they wanted to make a shift in their resources and their focus to picking up some of the challenges around Indigenous health and recognising that that would come at the cost of doing some things internationally, which, um, you know, I fully appreciate. Perhaps it was a little bit disappointing that, you know, we weren't going to be able to carry forward some of those initiatives, but they're the sort of hard decisions that need to be made. And then that brings a greater coherency and clarity, I think, to the conversations that you're having around the fund funding agencies, the scientific agencies and the branches of government. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. John. Uh, that, that pretty much um, answers uh, the question in terms of, you know, how the, the uh, there's a need for the government uh, and the institutions to, of course, work together uh, and, and ensure that uh, there is uh, community engagement at a level that affects almost everybody uh, who is sort of a stakeholder in this in this equation. Uh, since we have about uh, five to seven minutes uh, left uh, for the session, uh, I would like to uh, bring in a couple of audience questions. And uh, that's where uh, Alex and uh, Dr. Nee can also uh, come in. Uh, so the first question that we have from the audience is, can universities work with their local municipal government representatives to bring the global best practices to the city, including engaging these elected officials or bureaucrats in conversation with global role models in local governance and enhance their capabilities? Uh, uh, Dr. Nee, would you like to address that? Yeah, so very interesting question uh, from the audience. So Indonesia, I think we are multiculturalism here. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, it's really a uh, good opportunity if then we can reach like a, a society or people surrounding in very uh, unique culture. Because we are multicultural, so not all area in Indonesia is simple or uh, easy to reach the people. So why Universitas <clears throat> Erlanga have also floating hospital? So floating hospital is not only help or uh, do the medical uh, treatment for the people who stay in the remote area or island in Indonesia, but we also do by multidisciplinary approach. 
because some people maybe need another uh, like uh, education or another uh, technology transfer. So for example, Madura Island. Madura Island is next of Surabaya. Surabaya is our university location. So we are in the eastern part of, in, uh, of Java Island. So the next of us, Surabaya, we have also bridge Suramadu bridge. So we can reach Madura Island uh, by uh, car. Uh, and then uh, difficult to reach the remote, uh, the people uh, who stay in remote area like to uh, can be vaccination uh aspect so if uh, when the covid 19 is uh, the pandemic is also uh, happening in our country so the people who would uh, uh, have to vaccinate it by our government not so easy not all can uh, we can do for the all uh, people like, uh, for the 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 one example is madura people so then we should reach this remote area, remote island, by our floating hospital. So we call it Marco uh, Marco 19. Yeah. So Marco 19 is the uh, our program to reach the people in remote island in Madura. We still have 44 remote island near Madura Island. So it's mean near Surabaya. So not far from from us. These people need to educate it by using their culture. So we engage the chemistry uh, among us. So then we give uh, by their, their language because we have maybe more than 100,000 uh, local language, but we use our national language of Indonesia language, but they still have their local language so we have to uh uh to uh, like uh, close with them by engaging the chemistry uh, among us so we use their local language and then uh, we also uh, collaborate with the local uh, government in madura uh, the district area and then they give a permission to us uh, to reach uh, their people and then discussing and educating them. And you know that the natural resources still very rich in this uh, island, but no one can like uh, maintaining or yeah, this conservation uh, program like the uh, marine uh, resources, we have the oxygen is still rich also in one island in Madura, Gili Iyang, the name. So we give like technology transfer by using the solar energy to them. So to keep to maintain the oxygen content in their island. So it's not so easy. So this is the challenges of us to uh, engage people by using their culture. So then we are, uh, the finalize this program, we can then fascinate it uh, around 3,000 people. So I think this is, yeah, not so really uh, success all 100%, but this is a success to do for the 3,000. It's not uh, easy for that. I think this is also the important thing in Indonesia. We can do the community by using the local culture, the local uh, language, and also engaged by our psychological, yeah. So why I also understood why Turkey is not easy also for the like giving them like trauma healing or mental health uh, supervision or uh, any kind of this uh, kind of the impact of the earthquake uh, because this is so really uh, sensitive. So it's mean that we do the community uh, we should know the culture of their co the community and also what they need uh, from us. So it will be give the meaningful and impact for the society. I think it's Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ni. Um, I'm sorry, uh, fellow panelists. Uh, we have we've, we've run out of time. Uh, just about a minute left. Um, 
So I would I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of uh, uh, thank all my fellow panelists. And uh, of course, uh, what, what I can definitely uh, say in the light of all that we have discussed and all that we've deliberated on over the last about uh, 59, 60 minutes is the fact that uh, community engagement and more importantly, the university community engagement is not something that can just happen at the end of one individual. It is a it, it is a concerted effort. It is a collaborative effort between different individuals occupying different positions at the university and at the community level, which also includes the government officials. So only if everybody is uh, coming together to achieve that common goal and that common goal obviously also includes the SDGs uh, because eventually uh, what is important is to have a long-term vision. We cannot at this point uh, in our lives or in today's world or today's state uh, have a vision which basically spreads to about two years down the line. It has to be a, a vision document that is very much there which takes care of the next decade of what every university and community wants to achieve. And, in, and, and towards that goal, towards that objective, it is important for all the uh, communities and universities to work together uh, as much as they can. And this need not necessarily be restricted to just the urban communities. It's also about the rural communities and as much of an effort on the part of universities to consciously make an effort to engage with, with those uh, belonging to rural communities so that we can work towards uh, their upliftment. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, the session. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Paul, uh, Mr. John, uh, Professor Ni, nee, uh, Alex. Uh, it, it, it was a pleasure moderating uh, the session and uh, I would request the audience to, uh, to stay tuned because in a short while from now, we're going to begin the session 15 of the World University Summit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Hey, thank you.